old school. I apologize. <laughs> Last week I talked to you about the bigger picture, pointing everything in Scripture pointing to Christ. Everything pointing to Christ as the bigger picture of things in our life. When we're going through things sometimes, all we see is what we're going through, right? I mean, literally, all we see is what we're going through through at the time and reality is that's how we are that's how we live our lives is that we are focused on what we're going through many times today I want to talk to you about the bigger er picture the bigger er picture if you will uh, the Lord laid this on my heart and I want to I'm going to try to stay with my notes I'm going to try to teach preach if you will but I want you to get where we're going this morning I believe that the church has seasons I believe there's seasons when everyone comes to the front, everyone gets saved, healed, sanctified, delivered. You get filled with the Holy Ghost, there's power, there's anointing, there's all those things. And then there's seasons where God is teaching us, where we literally sit back, slow down, and God begins to teach us. And the reality is, we've been in a season of teaching for a little while, and, and I like those seasons. I, I enjoy the, the feel-good, too, of the power and the anointing, but I like the teaching, too. Because that's when we are rooted and grounded. How many know that if, if all you ever get is to feel good, when the trouble comes, you're not going to have nothing to stand on. But when you got some word in you, and the enemy comes against you, you got something to stand on. So this morning, I'm going to bring you exactly what the Lord gave me. I told Miss Irma, Miss Irma, where are you at? Wave at me right there. I told Miss Irma last Sunday night, I believe it was, I said... You be praying. God's already given me a word for next week, and I want you to pray that I'm able to present it the way that He would have it presented. So, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank You again for Your word. I thank You that You're willing to show up and love on us this morning. God, I pray that as we grow together, let Your anointing fall in this place. Anoint this old preacher, Lord. I'm not worthy, but You are. And I pray that you use me as a vessel today, God. Open the ears and the hearts and the minds of your people that we can receive from your word and from your sweet Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I have a question for you this morning. Who wrote the biggest portion of the New Testament? Paul. Paul? Are you sure? Because you know me, I'm trying something new this year. I'm stretching and I'm growing and I'm trying to, to, to learn new things and look at the Bible from a different angle. And, and Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, or so we've thought that. But if you take away the divisions, which weren't there in the first place anyway, and you take away the chapters and the verses and all those things, and you just put the letters together, did you know that Luke wrote more than Paul? Luke actually wrote more than Paul. He wrote the book of Luke and the book of Acts. And he actually wrote more words, per se, than Paul did. And so it's interesting to me, now, part of the book of Acts, or a good portion of it, he talks about the apostle Paul, but at the end of the day, my mindset was Paul wrote the bigger portion, but Paul didn't necessarily write the bigger portion. Luke did. So Luke writes in the book of Luke, and he writes the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, another one, if you will, because others wrote. But then he writes the book of Acts. And I want to read to you from the beginning of the book of Acts. And we're just going to try and break this down today. So turn with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. We're looking at the bigger er picture. Bigger er. I don't think that's a word, but it is today. Acts chapter 1. Stay with me for the reading of God's Word, beginning with verse 1. He writes, reading from the King James, we'll break it down a little bit farther than that, but the former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, these next letters are in red, ye have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days 
Hence, Father, once again, bless your word in your precious name. Amen. You can be seated. Now he starts saying the former treatise. And if you look that up in the Greek, here's what he says. In my last book, Logos, treatise is the Logos. It, it's literally in my last book, I wrote to you about Christ. In my last book, I wrote to you about Christ. And I'm going to get ahead of myself and go back and forth because I'm excited about the word. But in his first book, here's what Luke writes down. Luke writes down in the first one, he says, Having been an eyewitness to all the things that Jesus said and did and taught, I felt like it was good for me to write this down. I felt like it was good for me to write you another gospel or the gospel of Jesus Christ. I know it's already been written, but I felt it was good for me to write this down. Can I say this to somebody in the room today? If you would just stop and write down what God has done for you, you'd forget about what He hasn't accomplished in your life yet, and you'd stop worrying about the negative, and you'd start seeing the positive. When I got up this morning, give Him praise. Yeah, it's all right. I woke up this morning from the ugly dream I was having last night, and I'm thinking, whoa, I don't, what, what is that all about? And I'm looking at coronavirus moving around and this and that, and the latest and the greatest and all the politics of the world, but I thought, you know what? He gave me air in my lungs this morning. I praise God on your air in my lungs. I can breathe, I can shout, I can jump, I can run. He gave me a country where I can attend church this morning. Do you know that I I am so blessed that I can sit in the house of God with you this morning. You are blessed that He gave you the ability to be here today. And when I start thinking about all the good stuff, it's kind of hard to focus on the negative. David Crowder would have wrote it something like this. It says, uh, about talking about the weight of His glory, all of a sudden, I am unaware of the afflictions when I'm eclipsed by His glory. When I get caught up in the glory of God, I forget how bad it is going right. on around me. Right. How rough life really is when I get caught up in how good He is. Mm, I'll move on. He says, I told all of Jesus in my first book how he, what He began to do and teach until the day He was taken up. After through the Holy Ghost He gave commandments to the apostles, to whom also he presented himself after his resurrection with many infallible proofs for 40 days speaking things about the kingdom. Now for 40 days after he died and rose again, he was walking around the earth sharing with the apostles and he was telling them things that had, that had to take place. And I begin to think about this, and I, I don't know about you, and I'm going to get on this for just a minute today. I'm going to try to be good, but I'm not going to make a promise. I, I, I begin to think about Dr. Luke. I mean, you know that Luke was a doctor, right? And so Luke was a doctor, and I begin to think about Dr. Luke. His job is to take care of people's physical needs, right, Doc? That's your job, is to take care of people's physical needs. But, but Luke said, you know, I can do a little more than that. I can write about Jesus and the things I saw. I know there's already Gospels, but I want to do that. How many know, I mean, think about this for just a minute this morning. How many people in your life have not just done their job, but they went above and beyond? And that's the reason you're here today. Not because they did their job, but because they went above and beyond. Luke didn't have to do anything. He was a doctor. He could have done exactly that. But I'm so glad that there are men and women that don't do the bare minimum. It's not like Liberty Mutual who will only give you exactly what you need, but they'll go above and beyond and give you more. I am thankful that there are men and women. I'm thankful that there are pastors today that don't just stand in the pulpit and then turn their phone off till next Sunday. I am thankful that there are men and women of God that will mow their neighbor's yard or do whatever it takes to take care of someone along the way. And Luke was one of those guys. Paul writes about Luke. He says, the beloved doctor. Luke, the beloved. And I'm thinking, man, how many Christians today do more than is required? Or do they just do enough to get to heaven, right? If I can just get by, they used to say, by the skin of my teeth. Remember, I know you remember this. Lord, build me a cabin in a corner. If I can just get a cabin, if I can just get enough God to get a cabin in the corner, that's all I need right there. I don't need no more. All I need to do is get to heaven by the skin of my teeth. Where 
where is there even skin on our teeth anyway, right? I mean, think about that. But, but Luke went above and beyond. He said, not only am I going to write, and he's writing to Theophilus, but he's writing to the church, if you will. Anyway, I'll be good. He wasn't content with mending bodies. He wanted to help people spiritually. How many times do we want to help somebody spiritually? And I'm convinced in the world today that if Christians would go above and beyond sometimes, rather than the bare minimum, isn't it nice when one of your employees takes the extra step that they don't have to? Those are the ones, right? Michael Rash from Dillard, I saw on Facebook this morning, he was talking about his job. And he said how they were telling what a good job he did working at the notion home. And how he was so excited that God had blessed him with a job. And for four years he's been cooking and, and he's excited about and that they were bragging about what. And I'm thinking, you know, that doesn't come from somebody just doing the bare minimum. That comes from someone doing above and beyond. And if you're on social media, you've probably seen that little joke about the pastor. It says, if you'll just fill in until we get somebody. And they're sitting there as a skeleton still doing the same job, right? If you'll just fill in, those are people that do above and beyond what they're supposed to. Paul writes of him in Colossians 4.14, the beloved physician. And I love reading his books. I love how he tells about Jesus and his doings. And I love when Luke writes, he writes from a doctor's standpoint, which is bigger words maybe than, than I would normally get, right? And, and I like those because I can break them down. And, and the first time we meet Luke is in Acts chapter 16. He's in uh, Troas, if that's the way to pronounce it. And he's with Paul, Silas, and Timothy. He kind of becomes their staff doctor. And he traveled with Paul for years. And then he went with Paul to Rome where Paul died. And then after all these years, he says, I need to write this stuff down. I need to write this down. And now he's writing his second letter to Theophilus. And he calls him, uh, he calls him, oh, excellent or honorable Theophilus. You know what that means? That means that he's some type of leader. That means he's some type of leader and he's writing to him. And the only other times that he uses words like honorable or majesty or excellent or something like that is in uh, Acts 23, 26 about Felix and then Acts 26, 25 about Festus, the leadership. And he's doing that. But then he writes this story about Jesus and he's writing about the big picture, right? How many know that Christ is the big picture? If you've got Christ, you're saved. That's a big, big picture. But here's the thing with God. God's picture doesn't end with just a big picture. He goes panoramic. And the more you learn, the bigger it gets. And the more it gets, the bigger it gets. And the reality of that is, the expanse is far greater than we'll ever know in this earth. And people decide somewhere along the way they've got enough and they stop. Paul. Oh. Luke, <coughs> two years in Palestine, Luke is traveling, he's taking notes of Jesus and of the apostles, and he writes to Theophilus, and he says, it seems good to me to write these things down. But he doesn't just write about Jesus, he dedicates the book of Luke to him, the life, the authority, and the miracles of Jesus, but then he sees there's a bigger picture. Luke writes of the acts of the apostles. And now notice this when he says this. He's talking about the gifts that the apostles have and what they did, right? They, that silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give to thee in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. Take up thy dead and walk. And he's talking about the anointing on their lives and he's sharing about the birth of the church, if you will. And he, and he talks, about, uh, he talks about Paul more than any other, but Paul writes this. 18 and 19, Paul writes, I would not dare to speak of you of what Christ performed through me, but not me through signs and wonders, but by the power of the Holy Ghost. Verse 2 of chapter 1 of Acts gives us a bigger picture. It says, by the power of the Holy Ghost, Christ instructed them. And then it says these crazy words. The whole book has been talked about, focused on pointing us to Christ. That's what the book is about, pointing us to Christ. And then Christ arrives on the scene and here's what He says. He says in verse 4, here's what Christ says to them. I've been here, I've done my job, I'm leaving now and I command you. 
He doesn't say it's a chance. He doesn't say if you want it. He says, I command you to wait until you receive the Holy Ghost. See, the bigger picture isn't finding Christ. That's the bigger picture. But then it's following Christ and what He said for us to do. And the command that He tells to His children and to the apostles and to us through the Word of God, He literally writes, I command you to receive the Holy Ghost of God. That's not popular, but that's the full gospel. I know, see, we don't only get like three claps for that, right? But he said, Jesus said, verse 4, I command you. Jesus said the picture's bigger than just looking at me. I'm going away and I'm going to release the power of the Holy Ghost. Now we're going to talk about that for just a little bit. I know this isn't run the aisles, right? You could be though. If you got the Holy Ghost, you'll be happy right there. Jesus is the bigger picture. He's told about He's prophesied and He's proven from heaven to earth to the cross to the grave to resurrection that we might have life and have it everlasting. And then He says, I've done my part. Now I'm sending you the Holy Ghost. And I command you to wait, press in, push until you receive the Holy Ghost. I'm sending you power and authority and ability Wait for it because if your picture only sees Christ and you get into heaven, you're missing the bigger er picture. Come on. The power of the Holy Ghost. Now we'll get into why we have that in just a minute. But I want you to hear John chapter 20, verses 21 and 22. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so I send, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. He commanded and commissioned. You ever wonder why the church is not growing? Not just the local body, but the church in general? Because we haven't fulfilled the command and the commission that God has for us. The commission is to go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The command is receive the Holy Ghost so you'll have power to share the gospel to the entire world. Now we want to know why we're not seeing God do the things that He used to do. Part of the reason is, is because He commanded the church. And I used to believe with everything in me that, you know what, it's good if you get the Holy Ghost. Can I tell you this? Christ commanded them to wait till they receive the Holy Ghost and power and authority and anointing so that they can move forward. These are not my words. These are words written in red of the Christ. He says, I command. That's a strong word. And then he says that you can go out and preach. Let me review this. They needed a commission from God. They needed to know that Jesus was alive and resurrected. He spent 40 more days with them after that. And then he gives them a bigger er picture. You need, he commands them to be filled with the Holy Ghost. How many Christians, denominations, people miss the bigger er picture because we got what we just sang about, our blessing of heaven and salvation and deliverance from sin. But we never took the command and the commission and went farther with it. Mm. Then he gives them the bigger picture. How many of us expand our picture but stop short of receiving the Holy Spirit? When it comes to God, we can set our sights too small. My verse, you know it is, and, and God has been revamping this verse for me, but it's God as big as I'll let Him be. God's as big as I will let Him be. Ephesians 3.20, to Him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that I can think or ask. When I'm praying prayers for God to touch this or, or to protect that, and He's saying you could have prayed bigger. You could have went bigger. You could have went deeper. You could have went farther. Because the picture expands. When I find Christ, Christ points me to find the Holy Spirit. And then commands me to go after it. Well, I know that's ruffle and feathers, right? Because that's not what... But, but what all does He command of us to do? This is the first command is 
go and wait to receive the Holy Ghost that you can do what I've called you to do. God is expanding, never stopping. The picture grows. The book points to Christ and He points to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit empowers them to reach a lost and dying world. He empowers us. Now watch this. Why do I get the Holy Spirit? So that I can point the world back to Christ. Amen. Why would I lay hands on the sick and then recover? It's not for their healing. That's superficial. That's in this world. It's that someone will see and want the Christ that gave me the Holy Spirit for that to happen in the first place. Now when I don't lay hands on the sick because I'm not filled with the Spirit of God, then someone is missing the miracles and signs and wonders of God and they're not receiving what they can receive because I did not accept the command and the commission God gave me. Why am I supposed to lay hands and cast out devils? It's not to say, look at what I did, but it's to point men and women to Christ. Why is the Holy Spirit here to anoint us with power to reach a lost and dying world? How do we reach a lost and dying world? We can make every program on planet Earth, but if we don't have more Holy Ghost in us. And I like this word. I like this word, Brother Mark, Pastor Mark, the other Pastor Mark. I like the word fear. God's been rattling my cage with this word. You know why? Because you can't be caught up with things in the world if you're filled up with Christ Amen. and the Holy Spirit. Every part of me that is void of Him is an open hole for the world to get in and dig in and make a plan and start guiding me in the wrong direction. Why does He say you must be filled with the Spirit? Because when I'm filled with the Spirit, I can complete the commission that He has for me. I can do what He's called me to do and to go and see what He wants me to see. He says literally... John baptized you with water, but I'm going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. <coughs> Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. I'm on page 5 of 6. Almost done. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And they appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them and they were all filled. They were all filled. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. You will never make me believe in my studies that the first initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost is anything more than speaking in tongues. It is the initial evidence. I will believe that till the day I die unless God Himself reveals something different to me. But if I think that being filled with the Holy Ghost is about speaking in tongues, I've missed the commission and the command of Christ yeah. Jesus yeah. because the commission and the command of Christ Jesus is that I am to be filled up with the Holy Ghost of God working miracles, signs, and wonders through Him that the world might know that Christ is the Savior and that they might accept Him. Why do I need the Holy Ghost? Because the world is dying and going to hell. And I need the answer inside of me. The bigger picture is to be filled. I am truly convinced with everything in me that the body of Christ would not be fighting among each other and we wouldn't spend all of our time looking at the negatives and politics and you can get mad at me if you want. I don't care anymore. Here's the truth and the reality of it. If we spend all of our time filled up with hatred towards the world or towards a party or towards this or towards that, we're missing the fullness of Christ and we're sending people, damning people to hell because we're not sharing the love of Almighty God because we're filled up with hate for a Democrat or a Republican or we're filled up with hate for this or that or we're filled up with something other than the bigger earth picture the Holy Ghost of God. I used to think laying hands on the sick and them getting healed was all about them getting healed. And it, that's just a byproduct of showing the world about Christ. Why do you cast out demons? Because they need delivered? Because they need delivered and their deliverance is Christ Jesus. Why do we preach the fullness of the gospel? So that people might find and be delivered and set free that they might go out and share that old story that they heard. Page 120 of the Red Back. 
See, I worry so much sometimes about the miracles, the signs, the wonders, the prophesying, and all those things. And every one of those things, the whole Old Testament points to the Christ. Christ points to the Holy Spirit, which points everyone back to Him. And if I don't get Him, I miss the bigger picture of fulfilling my commission to reach a lost and dying world. You ever wonder why your life's in misery 24-7, 365 years, can't see you come out of it? Because you're filled up with the... I, I'm the preacher, not you. You have to touch right now. I love you, shut up. I'm just teasing. I'm just giving you a hard time. So I'm, I'm so glad you're back with us. I love you. I love you guys. Thank you. Thank you. But reality is this. If I'm not filling myself up with the Holy Spirit every day, then lust creeps in. If I'm not filling myself up, addiction creeps in. If I'm not filling myself up, then everything on planet Earth creeps in. Hate, anger, politics, stress, fear, anxiety, worry. But when I fill myself up with the Spirit of God, I don't have room for anything else because why do you think he didn't say, and be ye half full of the Spirit of God? Half full, that's not a word, is it? Feel, half full. Why did, why did he say, be ye three quarters filled? You want to lose weight? Be hungry. Because if you're filled all the time, you're not going to lose weight. Because your mind will tell you you're hungry all the time. Somebody say amen. amen. Why do you need the Holy Spirit? So I can be the fullness. First of all, I need it because it was commanded by Christ Jesus that I be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And we have denominations that will deny the power of God. And we have Pentecostals that are less than half filled with the Spirit of God anymore. They spend more time fussing and bellyaching and complaining about everything around them. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me very clearly. You'd stop doing that. If you were filled up with me, you wouldn't have time for all the garbage. Amen. And I'm like, but, 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 Lord, he went, yeah, that but comes from being not filled. Because my promises are yes and amen. amen. And he says, I want to give you gifts. I want to give your church gifts and power and anointing. You know why the Holy Spirit spoke through you this morning? Through the tongue of the interpretation that my word is here, receive my word. You know why? Because he wanted you to understand this. That there's a bigger picture than just being saved. There's a bigger picture than just being saved. And while you might be saved and you're tithing and you're doing it all right and your life is going smooth, those around you's lives are falling apart. And God commands us to be filled with the Spirit of God so that those around us. Yes. Luke 24. Again, Luke. Gosh, I love this guy. Jim Nelson, I love Luke. That's okay. I can preach from him. We don't like we don't like Proverbs anymore. We don't like James, but we like Luke. And that repentance, Luke 40, 24, 47, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached into his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem, Jesus speaking, until you be endued with power from on high. Woo! Yeah! Praise God! None of this scripture that is talking about this relates to salvation. It relates, relates to being filled with the Spirit after salvation. In fact, in the book of Acts, they ask this question. Have you received you? Believe. And it's so easy, church, for us to discredit it. Because we didn't get it the first time we wanted it. And, and let's be honest, as long as I'm full of other things, it's going to be real hard to let the Holy Spirit fill me. Come on. As long as I'm filled up with the garbage, it's going to be real hard to let the Holy Spirit fill me up. If I've got many sized full of everything else, and I want God to dump the rest of it on me, He can only feel what I will give Him to feel. To the amen. Glory. I'm going to land. I'm going to land the plane. It's good teaching from the Word of God. You're right. It's good. Not because I'm doing it, but because He's doing it. Scripture tells us to be filled with the Spirit. It means to leave.
leave no space for the world. When Jesus comes into your heart, he knows that you need to be filled completely and that with the infilling of the Spirit, Jesus commands and commissions us to be filled with the Holy Spirit and power, with authority and peace to do miracles that will draw the world to Jesus, to cast out demons and devils that will glorify Jesus, to have a prayer language that will speak what Christ would have us say, prophesy tongues, interpretations, to glorify Christ. What is the bigger picture? Christ. What is the bigger -er picture? To be filled with the Holy Ghost of God. To finish the commission that he gave us. Amen. Yes, I wonder why when you witness to somebody that they, there's no nothing in them that is stirred. But when you're anointed of God to speak to them and you're filled up with the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost goes before you, prepares yes. their heart, and He speaks to them. Amen. And then when you open your mouth, they begin to be stirred, not by your words. As I've said many times, you could be reading a Betty Parker cookbook, but when the anointing of the Holy Ghost, how many got saved in a church service and can't remember what the preacher said, but you know what your heart was saying. Amen. All you know is what the Holy Ghost was speaking to your heart, and you wanted to run to that altar. I remember when God said to me, it's time to come home, boy. Because I remember the Holy Spirit and I remember all my arguments. And without Christ, you can't be filled with the Holy Ghost of God. You have to have Christ first. But He commands them. <coughs> In the beautiful doctor's book, He commands them. Be filled with the Holy Ghost of God. I believe you will receive that with the evidence of tongues, a prayer language, not necessarily tongue and interpretation, but a prayer language. And I believe when you do that, if you allow Him to continue filling, you know what that means to be baptized in the Holy Spirit? It's not baptizo, it's baptizo, I think. You can correct me on that. Better seriously look it up for me at some point, because I'll forget. But one of the words means to be dipped. The other means to be continually dipped until there's a transformation. In other words, you dip a pickle or you dip a cucumber in water, you bring it out, it's a cucumber. But you continually dip it in vinegar and it becomes a pickle. It becomes something different. Baptizo means, I believe it's baptizo, means, the word means that to be filled until you are changed. You want to see the world reach the, for Christ? Be filled with the Spirit of God. And if you've got the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, I pray that almost every, I pray that everyone in this room does, but if you don't, you need that. And if you can pray a prayer like this. You don't have to pray. I'm so tired of hearing people say you have to pray a special prayer. If you love to pray a certain prayer, pray it. But let me say it like this. You can pray it like I did. God, if there's more of you, I want it. God, if there's more of you, I want it. God, if there's more of you, I want it. God, if there's more of you, I don't understand it. I never was raised around it. I don't get it. But if there's more of you, I want it. And when I got it, I was afraid of it because it felt different than anything I'd ever known in my life. But it changed my life forever. Yes. Yes, Lord. And while I still make mistakes, I've got this beautiful voice in the back of my head called the Holy Ghost that tells me. Church, I believe with everything in me that Christ commanded us. And if we're ever going to see the move of God in sweet home that we need to see, we need to be saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost of God. Give Him praise in the house.
moving of the Holy Spirit power would flow through this church. Those that are afraid, you would comfort them and let them receive. Those that don't want to let go, God, I'm praying that you would minister to them that they would be able to let go and give you the fullness of who they are that you might fill them with your spirit. Not that they can be a freak, but that they are commissioned to go forth and reach a lost and dying world. Lord, that they'll have a glow about them that people will want. God, I pray that you feel every man, woman, and child under the sound of my voice here. And Lord, I pray that you refill those that need a refill. Yes. And those online, Lord, and on the internet, Lord, for those that watch our videos, God, I pray that your sweet Holy Ghost would go forth and minister. God, I pray for supernatural outpouring that you promised in these last days. Peter said, this is what's happening. God, I'm praying that it begins to happen. God, have your way today. Save lost souls in this place. And then fill us with your sweet Holy Spirit that we can be what you call us to be. In your precious name. Amen.